Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Euro European Space Operations Center, ESOC, here in Darmstadt, Germany. We've just seen some very impressive images there from Mars, taken by Mars Express, ESA's first mission to the Red Planet. And today, we'll be heading there again, because today, on March the 14th, the European Space Agency, ESA, together with the Russian Space Agency, Roscosmos, will launch their first joint space mission ExoMars from the launch pad in Baikonur in Kazakhstan. Now then, we are live on ESA TV this morning, and the event is also streamed on the web. So to everyone out there watching us online or on TV, hello, good to have you with us, and of course, good to have all of you here with us here in Darmstadt. My name is Monica Jones, and I have the great pleasure to guide you through the program this morning and also later today in the evening. I'll give you more details about that in just a moment. But first, please do welcome here on stage ESA's Director of Operations and Head of the European European Space Operations Center, Rolf Densing. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the European Space Operations Center to witness the launch of ExoMars 2016. While everybody in this room, I'm sure, is very Im important, there are a few very extra special people around here that I would like to welcome. Among those is Mr. Axel Voss, member of the European Parliament. Ms. Pascal Ehrenfreund, chairperson of the executive board of DLR and an insider to ex uh, exploration herself, uh, being an exobiologist. Uh, I'm especially happy that uh, Professor Walter Kroll is with us, uh, one of the predecessors of uh, Ms. Ehrenfreund. Uh, he has also been president of the Helmholtz Gemeinschaft Deutscher Forschungszentren. And uh, he still is an uh, inspiration to me. So, Professor Kroll, I'm very glad that you are here. Our Russian partner today is represented by uh, Gregory uh, Karabatschak, head of the Space Exploration Department of Roscosmos, our uh, Russian partner agency, and uh, Mr. Ilya Chulkov, uh, he is deputy director of the Space Research Institute of Moscow. The city of Darmstadt is represented by Mr. Peter Franz, and I'm also happy that my federal director, Thomas Reiter, is with us today, and we will hear more from him on stage later on. There are also many of the scientists, engineers, and industrial partners with us today who have worked for years to provide their instruments to the ExoMars mission and to give the mission its very meaning. This must be the ultimate excitement for all of you, and I wish you well for a successful mission and for your instruments. 
We have heard that this event is covered live on ESA TV and streamed on ESA.int, and so welcome to everybody who is following us online. The ExoMars project is carried out, carried out in close cooperation between the European Space Agency and our partners of the Russian Space Agency. Roscosmos is providing the proton launcher that will bring the ESA spacecraft on its way to Mars. Launch will be in less than an hour at about 10.30. At this moment, we are, all, uh, we are at the beginning of a long and exciting sequence of events today. Sending a satellite to Earth's orbit is one thing. Embarking on an interplanetary mission, however, is a bit more challenging. For sure, it takes a lot of energy to fly to Mars, and there's no shortcut. In fact, the proton launcher and its breeze upper stage will take our spacecraft four times around Earth in ever wider ellipses, and uh, until the spacecraft has uh, reached its escape velocity and goes off on its interplanetary journey. Uh, we will see burns of the breeze upper stage always over the Russian territory and under control of our Russian partner. And uh, this is what takes quite a while. And uh, so we are expecting acquisition of signal in 12 hours after launch at uh, 22.30 this evening, hoping for first signal from our ground stations in Malindi over, over Kenya. <laughs> Once uh, the mission is released from the breeze upper stage, things will happen quite fast. Uh, the spacecraft will power on, which right now is powered off while uh, on the launcher. We will uh, have deployment of the solar arrays and, uh, and then hope for acquisition of the signal. This is the moment when our experts in the mission control room will resume control of the spacecraft. Our customer for this mission today is the ESA exploration program under the leadership of my fellow director, Alvaro Gimenez. He is in Baikonur today at the launch site. I would like to ensure all the people that have worked so hard to make this mission real, that the ESOC team has done their utmost to prepare for this mission. After years of preparation and many, many simulations, we are as ready as can be for launch today. So let's keep our fingers crossed. Thank you. Thank you very much. My apologies for interrupting you or dancing. Thank you for your speech. But I just hear that we are ready to cross over to the main control room now where Deputy Flight Director Michael Schmidt is just starting the roll call, an important step, of course, in the countdown sequence because it's to check and to confirm that the control ready, uh, the team is ready to go. Control room is just around the corner from here, so let's listen in. AUCS? AUCS, yes. Power. Power go. TTNC. TTNC go. Spacom. Spacom go. Right Project red. Project support. Softcore. Software support. S track. Comms. Maintenance. Scheduling. Thank you very much, all positions. Thanks for that. All right, so a lot of ticks there on a very long list, but it looks good. Uh, I assume that we've just been given the thumbs up. Spacecraft is ready to go. And I uh, also hope that we'll be able to see some uh, live images now coming to us from the uh, Russian Cosmodrome in Baikonur. That is where the launch pad is. And we should also be able to see there. Right now, I don't, but uh, hopefully we'll get this established soon. The Proton M launcher, which is standing upright. You could probably see this already on media before. By the way, this is the heaviest rocket, one of the heaviest rockets in the world, and right now it has the ExoMars mission under its fairing. Now, of course, there is a time difference between Germany and uh, Kazakhstan, so it's early afternoon there right now, but we do expect the launch to take place at 
10.31 a.m. this morning, local time here in Darmstadt. Then the satellite will go into a cruising phase for 10 hours, and then it'll be shot into its final trajectory to Mars and separated from the upper stage. This will be at around 9 o'clock this evening. And I see a lot of excited faces here. It does not mean that you have to stay here, put and sit for the next 11 hours and wait with us. Uh, we will end this stage program shortly after the launch and pick up again here in the evening. However, if you do want to stay, of course, we do have hourly updates and presentations for you throughout the day. Then again, we'll be live back here on stage at 10 p.m. this evening to bring you the key moment, which is the first signal after separation, so the first autonomous signal. And then we can really say that my, uh, the mission is on its direct way to Mars. It's a long day ahead, a busy day ahead. Uh, let's get it started straight away with a short address from ESA's Director General Jan Werner. And you can imagine that he is in Baikonur to witness the launch firsthand, but he did send us a short message. Here it is. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen in ESOC. I'm now in Baikonur, and I hope we will have a successful launch of ExoMars today. ExoMars is, of course, a very important mission for um, ESA, but also for some other nations, especially for Roscosmos, as they are our partner in Russia. So ExoMars is not only United Space in Europe, ExoMars is United Space in the world. We will try to have with this mission a cooperation with, with Russia, but also with the United States of America, and to a little bit more investigate Mars and whether there was some life on Mars uh, in the past. And therefore we have this mission which will go to Mars today to orbit Mars and to look to the different gases in the atmosphere of Mars. And I'm really very much impressed about all the work I can see here in Baikonur and I hope we all of us will see a successful launch later this day. And that was Jan Werner there sending us a message from Baikonur, the ESA's Director General. Our next two speakers are here with us in Darmstadt. They will speak one after the other, so I introduce them both together. First of all, we will hear German Space Agency's chairwoman of the board, Pascal Ehrenfreund, for a short address. And she'll be followed by Mark McCochran. He is the senior advisor at ESA's Science Directorate. Ladies first, so please give a warm welcome to Pascal Ehrenfreund. Dear ladies and gentlemen, um, dear Mr. Denzing, also dear Mr. Kroll, dear Mr. Foss, uh, all my uh, dear colleagues, humankind has been exploring space since the middle of the 20th century. And on the 15th of July, 1965, Marina 4 sent the first close-up images of Mars. Today, the red planet has also imaged and mapped in three dimensions, in color and at high resolution by the German High Resolution Stereo Camera, or HRSC, on board the European Mars Express spacecraft. So why do we find Mars so intriguing? Because we are trying to understand how life originated in our solar system. And today, we are continuing with the launch of the first part of the ExoMars mission and addressing the question that continues to fascinate us. Is there or was there life on Mars? After a very long development process, it is wonderful to see this mission become a reality. ExoMars is an excellent example of close European cooperation with committed scientists and engineers. And I'm also very happy that many of my colleagues are here. Many of them have worked uh, for ExoMars uh, more than 15 years. And um, I think it will be a great day. I hope it will be a great day for all of us. A proton launcher will lift off from the Russian Cosmodrome in Baikonur, carrying the Trace Gas Orbiter and the Schiaparelli landing demonstrator. They will travel to Mars to detect trace gases and to study uh, the planet's atmosphere. And the rover, uh, later on, is scheduled to follow in 2018. The DLR Space Administration is supporting ExoMars through the coordination of numerous German contributions. 
In addition, DLR institutes and German companies are involved in both parts of the mission. The DLR Institute of Aerospace Medicine conducted all the planetary protection verification measures on behalf of ESA. DLR Institute of Planetary Research in Berlin is part of the international team that will evaluate the data acquired by the color and stereo surface imaging system and thus the geological information. The planetary researchers from Berlin have also generated elevation models from image data acquired by HRSC. And Italian scientists have selected the landing site for Schiaparelli using this data. So DLR has provided also four sensors on the lander. Uh, they will continuously measure aerothermal parameters at various positions on the exterior as the vehicle passes through the Martian atmosphere. An electronic subsystem developed by DLR will be responsible for processing the signals from the sensors. To enable Schiaparelli to land safely on the surface of the red planet, the DLR Institute of Aerodynamic and Flow Technology performed extensive computer simulations and conducted tests in DLR various wind tunnels. This is due to the fact that the Martian atmosphere is very unlike that of Mars. And last but not least, OHB system in Bremen is responsible for the core module of the TGO spacecraft and Airbus Defense and Space built the heat shield and the thrusters for Schiaparelli. Now it is time to hope for a successful launch. As we all know, spaceflight always challenges the limits of what is possible. And I want to ask Mark now to come on stage. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, what an exciting day for everybody here. Uh, I was just in Australia giving some talks, and I flew back yesterday, and people said, why are you leaving Australia so early? And I said, well, because we're going to Mars on Monday. And it's not, not every day you get to say that. So uh, it's a huge privilege to be here on behalf of Alvaro Jimenez, the Director of Science, and currently the Exploration Program. And of course, thousands of people in European industry, uh, in the science community, with our Russian partners, and lots of people in ESA who've worked on the project side, on the science side, and on the operations side. Everybody's here, of course, uh, for today for mission operations, but the science operations people down in ESAC as well, who will be getting all the science data back from this mission. And this is the first in our series of ExoMars missions of course, and uh, it's thrilling to get this program off the ground, uh, hopefully this morning. But it's part of a long history of very, very important exploration missions the European Space Agency has flown. Uh, it's just 30 years ago, exactly to the day that we flew Giotto class Comet Halley in 1986. In the meantime, we've landed the Huygens lander on the surface of Titan. Uh, the furthest that anybody's landed away from the sun in the solar system. The Rosetta mission, of course, which everybody's familiar with, an absolute epoch-mating science mission and uh, just a very cool adventure. And uh, in 2003, we last flew to Mars with MEX, with Mars Express. And, of course, that made this fantastic discovery of the possibility of there being trace gases, and the particular trace gas, methane, in the atmosphere of Mars. And why is methane so exciting? It's been confirmed now from the ground, it's been confirmed from the surface of Mars, but why is it such a compelling thing? Well, it could come from deep under the surface of Mars uh, in a geological setting with warm water and rocks being altered, generating methane, which would be very interesting, warm water under the surface of Mars. But of course, the more exciting possibility is that this comes from life. Primitive life forms, similar to the methanogens we have on the Earth, which formed billions of years ago before all of the oxygen arose on the Earth, those life forms could also exist on Mars. And so with the trace gas orbiter, we're going to go and study where the methane's coming from, study whether it's seasonal, study the geographical locations, and maybe, maybe we can find out whether there's life extant on the red planet today. And of course, the next mission will go and start drilling two meters below the surface for that in the next ExoMars mission. So again, enjoy the day. Uh, we're all getting quite nervous. It's not just about the launch. We've got to get all the way through all the breeze burn stages to the end of the day. So we're all going to be drinking plenty of coffee and uh, go Mars.
Thank you very much, Pascal Ehrenfreund and Mark McCochran. Uh, of course, you should be used uh, to announcing very exciting news now here at the European Space Agency. Mark, always good to have you here. Now then, we have 40 minutes until lift off. Uh, that allows us a bit of time to talk a bit more about the mission uh, and its purpose. And Jorge Vago is with me here now. He is the ESA's ExoMars mission scientist, so you know an awful lot about this mission. Good to have you here. Uh, let me first ask something that may be the obvious. I mean, the Russians have flown to Mars since the 1960s. United States have landed even a series of rovers on Mars. India, China, the Arabic Emirates, they're all ready to go. Why is Europe going again? Good morning, Monica. So the interest in ExoMars, the connection line among our missions is the possibility for exploring bodies in the solar system that have the potential for life. And Mars is the closest candidate that we have, or perhaps the strongest candidate that we have. It's the strongest candidate, yeah. We've heard already there's a lot of expectation that there could have been life once, once upon a time, that we might still find traces there. The thing is, though, I mean, the ExoMars mission, the planning for it began in the 1990s. And back then, there was the plan to send a rover up there. Now we're sending an orbiter and a very pretty lander, yet one without wheels. So why this change of mind? Well, along the way, we found that in order for the rover to be able to communicate its data to Earth, we needed an orbiting platform that would act as a communication relay. And we tried to study whether we could fit both a large capsule with a rover on top of an orbiter, and it was technically impossible. So while we were cooperating with NASA, we decided to split what was originally a single mission into two. And okay. so that's how the first ExoMars mission was born and how the second one will take the rover. So we get two for the price of one, one in 2016, one in 2018. Well, this is, this is even more exciting then. But tell me a bit, what is it about Mars? Why are scientists so obsessed with it? Why do they believe that there could have been life there? Well, for this, Mars Express has been key. Not only has it found methane in the atmosphere, which is interesting, but it also found that conditions very early in the history of Mars were similar to those we had on Earth at the time when life appeared on our own planet. So we're talking about the window between, let's say, 4.3 million years ago, uh, sorry, billion years ago, and about 3.8 billion years ago. Mars had plenty of surface water on the surface, and thus, there's a chance that microbial life could have started there. Now, if that happened, we know that Mars took a wrong turn later on. It became gradually the desert cold planet it is today, bathed in ionizing radiation. But if there was life early, it could have found refuge in the subsurface, and maybe this methane we're seeing today has some connection with that. Okay, well, that would be exciting, wouldn't it, to find traces of life there, really. Uh, now, the TGO, the orbiter, has a piggyback, and it is called Entry, Descent, and Landing Demonstrator. It actually has a much more pretty name, Schiaparelli. It's a, quite a heavy load of 600 kilos. Tell us about that. Yes. Um, what is interesting about Schiaparelli is that for the first time, we have a mission landing during the dust storm season. This is a time during the Martian year when the atmosphere of Mars is loaded with very, very fine dust. Now, this creates a different landing regime for our landers. And it will be interesting because being the first mission, we will obtain a very important data point for all spacefaring agencies to have. On top of that, once we land on the surface, there is an environmental station on the lander that will conduct some classical measurements like pressure, temperature, wind speed, direction, um, atmospheric opacity. But for the first time, you see this antenna here. Yeah. That's a micro iris uh, sensor. And it will study the electrification of the atmosphere. And we think this is a very important process for shooting up dust 
into the atmosphere doing this very large okay. global storm. Okay. And Schiaparelli, of course, the name comes from an Italian astronomer, Giovanni Schiaparelli, who discovered those suspicious traces, those structures on Mars, igniting a huge scientific debate and lots of science, science fiction stories. But we're back to science here. And you and I will be talking a bit on uh, in just a moment. But first, uh, let me remind you that right now we're 35 minutes away from the launch. So that's a good moment for us to check again with the main control room. And I hope that we can see and hear Micha Schmidt there, the Expo Mars Deputy Flight Director. There he is. Uh, hello, Micha. Now, we've already seen you perform the role call and it looked like everything was uh, okay. Anything changed now? Everything still on green? Good morning, Monica. Good morning, everybody. Uh, yes, uh, it's a good morning for us and uh, it is a still go, as you have hold, heard in the roll call. And uh, we are still nicely tick marking all our steps in the <laughs> network countdown procedure. Okay, because you mentioned those ticks, that was quite a long list. Uh, you're not alone in the control room, are you? There are other people there. Can you, can you introduce us to some of them? Tell us what they're doing? Yes, so if you would like to follow me, I can show you around a little bit. So there is uh, one position right next uh, to the flight director, which is a project representative. So actually he represents the technical team in STEC and the Technology Center, who was taking care of the development of the spacecraft. And uh, now they take, or they give more or less reluctantly over to us uh, the control of the spacecraft. And he's backed up also by a big project support team from industry in another room here. Then I would like to go to the next position, which is uh, the spacecraft operation manager. Sylvia, good morning. And she orchestrates uh, the teams of engineers in the front row and uh, she's overlooking the spacecraft and the health checks of the spacecraft. And then uh, let's go a little bit to the back rows. Here we have the OMs, the operations managers for the crown station. They make sure that actually the network of crown stations, which we need very uh, uh, urgently for uh, coverage in the LEOP, uh, are ready for us whenever we come above the horizon. And then also last not least, I would like to introduce you to the guardian angels, angels uh, of our mission control system, they are overlooking our computer programs we need to operate the spacecraft and send our telecommands and receive the telemetry, which are the software coordinators. And again, they are being supported and backed up by a support team somewhere else. So the people you see here and uh, in the uh, uh, other uh, associated rooms, like for instance, Flight Dynamics, which are also next door, maybe count to 45, 50 people. But uh, where do you okay. draw the line? Yeah, so, a, a lot of people there, a lot of people for such a complex mission, no wonder. Well, Michael Schmidt, thank you very much. We'll be catching up with you later again. I have one more question here for Jorge, which is why I'm happy that you're still here. Uh, just briefly, I mean, this mission didn't come out of nowhere. As I mentioned, there were other missions to Mars before. Um, and also Europe was already headed to Mars. What kind of science is this particular mission based on now? Well. The trace gas orbiter is trying to follow up on the discovery of Mars Express of methane. So as Mark explained in the beginning, we're going to study the distribution of methane, the seasonal variations, and by also looking at another host of trace gases, we'll try to um, find out if we can establish a connection with either life or geology. Then there's a surface science, which will be brief but important. And then we pave the ground for the next much more ambitious surface part of the mission, if you like, um, which uh, will focus on the search for morphological and chemical biosignatures of a possible presence of life very early in the history of Mars. Now, all the missions that have gone until now to the surface of Mars have dug in the order of 10 centimeters. We'll go down Deeper. two meters. That is a big deal for the yeah. possible preservation of chemical compounds. Well, so we definitely we all look forward to that moment, Jorge. Of course, there's still a long way to go, a lot of exciting moments before that. Uh, thank you so much, Jorge Vago, for filling us in on this. I'll take your microphone. And of course, from what Jorge told us, yes, you may applaud him. He did a good job, I think. Uh, 
Now, mankind always held a fascination for Mars. First, we studied it with a telescope, then we started uh, launching rockets and satellites and even human beings. And certainly, for some reason, Mars always had a special fascination, and it was always right on the top of our interest. Take a look. Ever since the ancient Egyptians observed a red celestial body with changing phases, Mars has been a source of fascination. In the age of the space rocket, there have been more than 40 missions to Mars, successful and unsuccessful, starting with the Soviet Mars 1M in 1960. America achieved a flyby in 1964, sending back the first photographic images of the planet. The Soviets orbited Mars and landed the first small device in 1971. In 1976, NASA's Viking mission sent back 16,000 photographs of the planet and its surface. In 1997, NASA's Sojourner roamed the surface of Mars for nearly three months. India has sent a mission to Mars, and of course Europe has played a major role in the exploration of the planet. Mars missions have confirmed what 17th century astronomers thought when they saw the planet through the first telescopes. It has much in common with Earth, polar ice caps, four distinct seasons, dust storms, the largest volcano in the solar system, and a canyon to eclipse the Grand Canyon at 5,000 kilometres long. Formations on the surface of Mars bear similarity to dried-up riverbeds on Earth, suggesting the possibility of water. In 2003, ESA's Mars Express was the first mission to find evidence of ice below the Mars surface. And it was the first mission to discover methane in Mars's atmosphere. NASA's Curiosity rover later discovered variable spikes of the gas. As Mars's volcanoes have long been inactive, where does the methane come from? Is it from other geological activity, or is it from previous or even existing organic life? If there's one thing all these missions have proved, the more is learned about Mars, the greater the fascination becomes. Fascination there, and it certainly also comes from all those marvelous images that we've already received from Mars, thanks to high definition cameras, thanks to landers uh, and rovers on the Martian soil. Thing is, though, it might look easy, but it is very, very difficult to land on Mars because of its thin atmosphere. And these, uh, this lady and this gentleman here on stage with me will be able to tell us a bit more about that. We have here two ESA system engineers of the ExoMars mission, Pia Mitschdorfer. Uh, she's uh, responsible there for the orbiter now, and Olivier Bail for the lander, which is why you're closer to the lander. And Olivier, can I just hand you the microphone first of all? Uh, so it's very difficult to land. Why did so many missions before failed? Why couldn't they land? Thank you, Monica. So indeed, the main difficulty to land on Mars is coming from its particular atmosphere. The, when you land on a planet without an atmosphere, like the moon, you only need to fire a landing engine, and this will bring you smoothly and softly to the surface. When you land on a planet with an atmosphere, like the Earth, the friction with the atmosphere will help you a lot to slow down, and if you open a parachute big enough, you can have a soft landing. The problem with Mars is that its atmosphere is not thick enough to decelerate uh, sufficiently the capsule. And even if you open a big parachute, you're still traveling at about 300 kilometers per hour, and therefore, you also need to have landing engines firing close to the surface to have a soft landing. And all these successive steps have to happen in a very, very short time. And th this is the difficulty. And all the systems have to run like a clockwork to make sure that we have a successful landing. Now, of course, this lander is, uh, on the one hand, it's a science lab. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a reason for it why we want it on Mars. But it's also studied with uh, a lot of sensors that permanently monitor and test how the lander behaves during the landing sequence. Uh, what exactly are the major steps down to Mars, bit by bit, as it descends? So the first step is to separate from the, from the TGO, from the orbiter. This will be three days before uh, reaching Mars. And shortly after, the Schiaparelli module will go into a hibernation mode to save the energy from its batteries. And only one hour before reaching Mars, all the Schiaparelli will uh, automatically wake up and prepare all its systems for the, for the entry in the atmosphere. 
The first step will be then that the heat shield, the protective heat shield, will uh, take the friction from the atmosphere and will decelerate from 20,000 kilometers per hour down to 1,500 kilometers per hour. During this very short time, about three to four minutes, the, the, there will be a lot of heat generated around the, the lander and the temperature will go up to 1,700 degrees Celsius on the outside. After that, we will deploy the parachute which is also a very uh, tricky moment. This yeah. has to be done at a very particular velocity. And shortly after, we will release the front shield. And this is a key moment, because then we will have uh, access to the radar altimeter, which is beneath the lander. We cannot see it here. And this will acquire the mm -hmm. altitude and the velocity with respect to the surface. And based on that information, Schiaparelli will automatically detect the right moment to separate the parachute and fire its landing engines. Okay. So at that point, Schiaparelli... All of this, of course, also at a particularly difficult season with lots of storms. So I have yes. a feeling you on purpose chose the most difficult scenario for the lander to really be sure that this, all this technical stuff will work. Pia, it's not just difficult and uh, challenging for the lander, but also for the orbiter. I'm told that it has to perform a giant maneuver when it has to slow down its travel speed in order to get into the right orbit around Mars. It will burn almost half of its propellant within two hours. Uh, it sounds like this uh, orbit of the satellite is really heavy. It is. <laughs> this is not a full-scale model, of course. If you would have seen the full-scale model, the real <coughs> spacecraft, not the model, you would have been super impressed. It's beautiful. <laughs> Scaparelli, there on top, looks much better. <laughs> the orbiter itself is uh, not very spectacular, but it is heavy. You see the main body is about 3.5 times 2 times 2 meters. We have a huge uh, High gain antenna that works in the X band frequency is a 2.2 diameter uh, okay. dish. Pia, I'm so sorry, I'm so impolite today, oh, but yes. yes, we're having a launch yes. and we have to head to the MCR because something very important is happening there uh, because it is now 25 minutes to the launch and the flight director there is giving the final go. We don't want to miss no. that right now. No, no. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much for being on stage. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. There he is. We have a uh, non-break power supply. That's affirmative, the non-break power supply is operational. Okay, we have communications. Affirmative. Thank you. Soft cord uh, OD on the briefing group. Uh, can you give me the status of the machines? We are going to go. Flight dynamics OD on the briefing group. Can you give me the status of your flight dynamic systems? Flight dynamic system is full functional. Copy, thanks. Somebody on the briefing loop. Uh, does the team go? The flight control team is go for launch. Project wrap OD on the briefing loop. Uh, what about your team? We are green for launch. Okay, we are good to go. Thank you. Okay, he's scratching his chin, but I think everything is green here in Darmstadt. And just to pick up, because I had to so rudely interrupt uh, Pia, uh, if you want to see a satellite of similar size with a similar antenna, everyone here, if you have a moment, just walk down here on the compound down the road. There's the Rosetta uh, satellite, very, very similar in size. Okay, well, we had a, just a brief look also uh, uh, to Baikonur, to, uh, where we saw the launch pad. Here it is again. So the Proton rocket there is uh, now running on batteries. Uh, the, land, uh, the, the satellite on top of it, that is. It's running on batteries, uh, ready to go. The launcher itself will report its final readiness two minutes before the launch, and that's about 20 minutes until it happens. Uh, the ExoMars program, as you can imagine, is a very complex one. So it needs an awful lot of expertise from an awful lot of people. And this is why it's a joint project of the European Space Agency together with the Russian Space Agency, Roscosmos. And we're very happy here to have one of the key scientists from Russia with us, Daniel Rodionov. 
He is coming on stage now. Welcome, Daniel. He's the Russian ExoMars project scientist from the Space Research Institute, IKI, in Moscow. Good to have you here with us, Daniel. Good morning, Monica. Good morning, colleagues. IKI. It provides two experiments in the orbiter. They're named ACS and FRIEND. Tell us a bit what these instruments are doing. Okay, so our first contribution to ExoMars 16 mission is a ACS, that stands for Atmospheric Chemistry Suite. It's actually not one instrument. It's a set of three instruments, uh, three uh, infrared spectrometers. So the main goal is to study Martian trace gases. So this is the main aspect of a mission. And uh, let's take a good example, like Jorge mentioned, and methane. So we will be able to map methane over the whole mission period to different, uh, during different seasons. And uh, that's a very good thing to do. <laughs> and uh, the second instrument is a friend. It's a neutron detector. So it's used to map a hydrogen just below the surface. And again, with a very high resolution. Now, we hear a lot about uh, trace gas. I mean, what kind of scientific expectation is behind the new trace gas map on Mars? Well, coming back again to methane. So, so far, we don't uh, know the origin of methane in Mars. Is it comes from a geological process or from biological process? And if we are able to map it uh, during different seasons and globally and see how it changes uh, and correlate it to other trace gases, that uh, will help us to answer this question, which is actually a question of the sixth mission, the main one. And uh, also, uh, volcanic gases are very important. We have no detected volcanic activity on Mars. Maybe it will be changed. I don't know. And uh, also, uh, measurement of uh, mass climate from the surface is quite important. Now, as, as we speak, we, of course, see the countdown here and also the launch pad in Baikonur. It looks a bit overcast right now from where we are. Uh, Daniel, the orbiter will, of course, measure all those trace gases uh, uh, for many, many years. The other instrument, FRIEND, I think it's very important also for the possibility of human travel to Mars at some point. Tell us why. Okay, so a little bit more about the friend. So this is uh, not uh, this is the development of an instrument which flew on the Mars Odyssey mission, but this time it will be able to map uh, uh, water just below the surface with much better resolution, up to ten times better. So and it also has a dosimeter unit, so it can make a radiation survey, which again quite important for a future exploration of Mars, even a manned one. And again, mapping, getting a good maps of water distribution under the surface can influence the place where you will actually land. Okay, Daniel Rodionov there from Russia. So good to have you here on stage and explaining uh, the parts that Russia is contributing, of course, also to this mission. Thank you so much for Thank being you, here. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. All right, here's something for your imagination. So you fly to Mars, you land there eventually, you start to drill and examine, and then suddenly you discover life. Maybe just teeny, teeny, teeny uh, on a microbiological level. But how can you be sure that this is actually a Mars inhabitant and not something that you brought along from Earth? Very tricky, because one of the problems when it comes to the search for life on outer planets is contamination. And that is something that needs to be avoided. ESA and Roscosmos have really been working very, very hard to avoid contaminating Mars in the preparation to ExoMars. And we have now ESA's planetary protection officer on the line, Gerhard Kminek. He's at the Baikonur Cosmodrome. And I hope I can hear him. Gerhard, there you are. Hi. Yes, good morning, Monica. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. So please tell us, very You're difficult welcome. for us to imagine, how do you clean a satellite? Well, all the activities that we had to do on the skip, skip friendly lander, uh, we had to do in special clean rooms that are about 10,000 times cleaner from a biological point of view than the regular clean rooms we used for spacecrafts. Um, the flight hardware, including actually all the parts of the rocket, had to go through uh, numerous cleaning steps and the majority of the hardware on the lander was also exposed to a dry heat sterilization processes. Now, each of the sets had to be checked, of course. In total, we did about 3,000 uh, biological assays. And at the end, to avoid recontamination, we applied uh, seals and filters at different levels. 
Though, Gerhard, I know that surgical instruments, they can just be put into a, a sterilization machine. Can you do something like that with a satellite mm -hmm. too? Well, not easily. Um, we had to develop new operating procedures uh, for the clean rooms, and we also established a dedicated training and certification program for the involved personnel. And on top of that, we had to build new infrastructure. Uh, a good-sized uh, new biological-controlled clean room and a laboratory at the tallest site in Torino uh, for the main build phase of the lander, and then a portable uh, special-purpose clean room tent that we used for the testing at Talas in Cannes and here uh, for the activities at the launch, uh, launch site in Baikonur. All right, so we can be sure that ExoMars is crystal clean there. Gerhard, thank you so much uh, to speak to us on the phone from Baikonur. And, uh, ladies You're and welcome, bye-bye. Okay. Uh, well, up until now, we sent robots into space uh, to explore Mars, certainly, but I'm sure that most of us here in this room and out there dream of the day when humans will actually set foot on the red planet. And that idea is certainly something I should think that excites my next guest here on stage. You all know him as the ESA Director of Human Space Flight and Exploration, and of course, as an astronaut. So please do give a very special welcome to Thomas Reiter. Do come up and join me, please. Thomas, good to have you here. Thank you, Monica. Good to be with you. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> now, I know that you've spent one year in space Almost. as an ESA astronaut. Last uh, week or two weeks ago, Scott Kelly returned. He'd just been there for a year. Some Russian cosmonauts have been there for even longer. So it is possible for humans to be in space, but traveling to Mars, so far, it seems to be very remote. Uh, do you think it'll ever happen? I'm pretty sure. I mean, missions like ExoMars and more robotic missions in the next decade will pave this way, but I'm sure maybe in 20 years, 30 years, this moment will come when humans will get on the planet. We have still to solve some problems, but I have no doubt that this will happen. I, I, but what's the point? I mean, apart from the idea certainly being nice, but we do have pretty capable landers on there, rovers are there, they're doing a good job. Why sending a human there? Well, to make it short, I think there are two main reasons. One is the scientific one, and one is a little bit more cultural. So the scientific reason, if I talk to colleagues, to planetary scientists, and uh, we have here uh, Ms. Ehrenfreund from DLR, some of the colleagues in the Institute for Planetary Science, for example, they have mentioned if they could be on Mars for 10 minutes, that would save 10 years of doing research wow. with robots. I mean, having a human there who is knowledgeable, who can look around and just see certain funny things on the surface, probably can really enhance the science that you can do there. Well, it's good to know that humans are still irreplaceable when it comes to that. That is good news. Uh, from the cultural point of view, is there another reason, perhaps? Oh, yes. Well, I think humans are explorers. It's just a dream. And, I mean, the name of this lander, Schiaparelli, is a little bit pointing to that. You have that mentioned. Uh, in the 19th century, he has um, seen as an astronomer these canals on the, on the surface of Mars. And, of course, that gave rise to a suspicion that there might be uh, some kind of extraterrestrial beings there. So, I mean, humans are explorers, and I'm sure that uh, earlier or later we will make the way. Maybe not directly. I'm pretty sure that the moon will play an important role. Mm -hmm. You are all aware of the concept that our director general has brought forward, the lunar village. So, moon can be really an important stepping stone there. It has a important uh, uh, relevance uh, also for science. We can prove a lot of the technologies that would be used. Uh, you were just talking to one of my predecessors of uh, using the water that might be on Mars for so-called in situ resource utilization. So we can generate oxygen, we can generate hydrogen, so make fuel for returning back to Earth, for sustaining a station there. So all this is now on test in the International Space Station, life support systems, wow. radiation protection, and that will gradually prepare the way for humans to get to Mars. I, I can hear we're on the right track there, Thomas. <laughs> now, of course, uh, because you just mentioned that with uh, water, creating water and recreating water, I mean, there are a lot of spin-offs, certainly technical ones, uh, uh, MPEG-3 and uh, digital cameras. I mean, uh, space exploration has already done a lot for developments here on Earth, and we probably can expect more. Absolutely. I mean, if you think about that we have uh, uh, extended regions on this earth where the problem of having access 
to pure water is getting more and more a problem. I mean, life support systems are exactly going in that direction. So all this technology which we are developing for preparing such a mission also have a spin-off for those regions. Or think about um, preparing agriculture in those regions which are where it's at the moment still very difficult. We are trying to um, adjust uh, plants in a way that they can sustain life even if there is a drought for longer extended periods. So research that we are doing in space for preparing such a mission for understanding biological phenomena is also a benefit for um, people here on Earth and specifically for regions where it's today is still very difficult to okay. live. Okay, so sci it's again a case. It's not such science for the sake of science or because people want to go where no one has gone before. It is for the greater good of all mankind. I find that very insp inspiring, Thomas Reiter. So good to have you here Thank on you stage. Very much. Thank you so much. You. And of course, of course, uh, just in case you do not know, uh, Thomas still, to this day, holds the record for the longest period of a non-American, non-Russian crew member in orbit with a total of 350 days in space. That's impressive, but it's not enough for a round trip to Mars. You need to be in space for much, much longer. And that is why in the year 2010, the Russian Institute for Bio Biomedical Problems, they performed a spectacular experiment. Take a look. In 2011, six volunteers began a 520-day mission to Mars without leaving the Earth. The carefully selected astronauts ate, slept, trained, lived and worked in an isolation unit at a research facility in Moscow. The experiment was designed to simulate the conditions humans would experience on a real mission to Mars. Mars 500 extended two previous experiments, one lasting 14 days and one 105 days to the full length of a round trip to the Red Planet. 250 days to travel out, 30 days to explore the surface, and 240 days for the return journey. The 150 cubic metre isolation unit consisted of four interconnected modules, hermetically sealed from the outside world with their own air and ventilation system. There was also a fifth module simulating the Martian surface. Each Marsonaut had a separate small sleeping chamber. They shared a communal living room, a gym, a medical unit, laboratories and an experimental greenhouse. Daily life in Mars 500 followed the same routine a real Mars mission would take. Crew were responsible for all maintenance and life support operations. They conducted scientific experiments, medical monitoring and followed a strict exercise and dietary plan. The crew maintained contact with ground staff and family members, but as their mission got further away from Earth, the time delay on communications was increased. Mars 500 tested the physical and psychological effects of the journey to and from Mars. The experience will be used to help plan future human missions to the Red Planet. All right, and one of the survivors of this spectacular experiment here, Mars 500, is here with us this morning, Diego Urbina. Good to have you here. Thank you. And I believe it was exactly today, five years ago, that you said goodbye to Mars and you started your return uh, flight to Earth. Tell us, how was it? What was it like? Did you enjoy it? Well, yeah, uh, we, by, by now we would have done the trip that uh, ExoMars will start today, so eight months on the way to Mars, and we would spend one month uh, on Mars operations, and by now we would be coming back. Uh, that was the most exciting part of the trip when we the, got to do the spacewalk and all these kind of operations. So there were a lot of ups, a lot of very exciting moments. We celebrated together everything that we could, all the birthdays, all the New Year's, <laughs> um, and uh, we tried to keep cheered up, so it was overall uh, an enjoyable, uh, although sometimes difficult experience. Of course, you're an electronic engineer in, in, in real life, and you were one of 5,000 volunteers to take part in this experiment. Why? Why did you want to do that? Well, it was a personal motivation of mine. I wanted to contribute with a little part to the, you know, something larger than yourself, such as 
the exploration of uh, the solar system and the expansion of humankind into the solar system, um, and also, uh, well, to learn what a crew would have to go through so that in the future we're able to support correctly the, the crew when they will go. As you mentioned the crew, I mean, you ended up there with three Russians, one Chinese and a French guy in a somewhat pokey sealed spaceship model. Uh, I, I, that must have been quite trying. I mean, what's your, your personal experience there? What did you take from those 17 months? Well, I learned many things. We learned many things uh, from the point of view of, of operations, of what will need to be done when we go there, the fact that we need to possibly focus on selecting a group as opposed to selecting the single individual. Uh, a group that works well together, you mean? Exactly, okay. exactly. Uh, because we're, we're working in an international environment, such as, you know, the, the, these kind of missions are always international. You have to, you know, pick the, pers the people that will get uh, uh, the better uh, along. Um, yeah. yeah, okay. <laughs> well, I think that is a, a point worth mentioning and a point taken. People have to work together on a very small space for a long time. Diego Urbina, thank you so much for sharing that experience with us. Thank you. <laughs> and of course, we can see there the launch pad uh, in Baikonur with the launcher ready to uh, take off. We have about about six minutes still to go. Uh, just a brief moment, perhaps, to remind ourselves why we're doing this. Now, we heard it already several times. It's about, basically, ultimately, the search for traces of life. And this is why the ExoMars mission has three main objectives. For one, the TGB orbiter. It will become the next communication satellite around Mars, establishing contact between the landers and future rovers as well, between Mars and Earth. The Schiaparelli lander here, it will test the latest landing technology. We already heard that it's going to be very, very difficult, the season chosen for it to land. And this technology has, by the way, been developed here by European industry. And finally, both the orbiter and the lander, they will examine the Martian atmosphere. They will search for methane. We heard that water, other trace gases. And they will also keep a very close eye on the weather uh, on Mars in detail. And if all of this is working out well, then two years from now, the ExoMars rover will follow, paving the way for perhaps a more or less distant future when the first human visitor will also visit the red planet. So I believe we're approaching the five minutes to lift off. Uh, the Proton rocket waiting on the launch pad. I think it's a good time for us now to cross over to the main control room one last time to check with the deputy flight director, Michael Schmidt. I can see his, his sign there. He's hopefully there too to tell us if everything is on schedule. There you are, Micha, tell me. Yes, uh, hello again. Yes, uh, there's nothing else we can do. We have done everything we can do here. Uh, the spacecraft is now on its own batteries. That has been checked by Baikonur and by us as well. And now we're crossing fingers and eagerly waiting. Okay, let's cross fingers and everything else we can cross. Micha, thank you so much. Four minutes, more or less, to take off. And uh, I need an expert now on stage because we're getting very close to a very exciting moment. I need someone who can talk us and walk us through what's happening. And we just have the perfect person here. Michael Kahn, he joins me on stage. He's an expert in mission analysis. And incidentally, he's calculated the flight trajectory of ExoMars. Michael, nice to have you here. Thank you. Okay, um, you talk us through the launch and the early stages, but we're not there yet. We still have a few minutes, so perhaps you can first tell us a bit more about this launch pad in Baikonur. Where is it? Why are we there? Baikonur is the <coughs> launch pad that's used mostly by Russian launch vehicles, and it's in Kazakhstan. It's not in Russia. It used to be in the Soviet Union, but then now they have a contract with Kazakhstan to keep on using it. And uh, it's, uh, it's a vast, uh, it's really huge, it's an enormous place just in the middle of nowhere. And that's precisely why it was chosen, because it is in the middle of nowhere. So okay. if something goes wrong, you don't hit anyone. It's a shy launcher. It wanted to be all alone. Uh, and of course, we have actually pictures of the rollout of the launcher. Uh, and in a moment, hopefully, we'll be able to see that, because this, this huge rocket, uh, it wasn't always in Baikonur. It had to be brought there. There we see the lander still. Uh, tell us, bit by bit, what's been happening there on Friday. So here we see the spacecraft with uh, the TGO, with the EDM mounted on top already, and it's being brought into, into the horizontal position. 
because that's the way Russian launches work. Everything's integrated horizontally. In Western rockets, it's vertically, and it's much more complicated, but of course, it's, it's kinder on the payload. And uh, here, you have to be careful. You have to change it from 90 degrees to zero degrees, and then move it in. Here, you see one half of the fairing coming in. It's integrated already, the lower half of the fairing. That will protect the payload during the ascent from the thermal and load and the, the, the drag forces of the atmosphere. Here, it's being closed. And here, it's on a, on a train. So, yeah, it's transported from the integration facility to the launch pad by, by train, of course, very slowly, very carefully. And uh, you can see that uh, there's a kind of hood on the, on the fairing with pipes going in and out, and that's air conditioning. So you have a controlled environment uh, underneath the fairing all the time. Okay, they're all really, really very careful. Uh, to lift it now. I think they're raising it now. Yes, now yeah. it has to, well, now finally it has to be brought to the upright position so it can be launched. And uh, it will stand there. It's just freestanding. It's not uh, clamped down or anything. So it, this was on, the, on Friday. And uh, today it was the lower three stages were filled with uh, 620 tons of propellant. The upper stage, the fourth stage, the breeze had already been filled before it was integrated. Okay, and I think, uh, Michael, now that we know what's been done before the launch, it's ready for us to concentrate on the launch, which is happening in about a minute from now. That's a good moment for us to just stay quiet and let you watch as things unfold. We'll pick up with you later again. I think it is safe to say that ExoMars has lifted off into space successfully. That means the very first European-Russian Mars mission is on its way. Well done. So, 
So Michael Kahn, uh, again, expert in mission analysis, and you've calculated the flight uh, of Exo Mars. You're still with me, of course. Uh, sadly, it was a bit overcast, so we couldn't see all the stages, but you can tell us what is happening next. I mean, as we speak now, the first stage, I believe, is almost burnt out. Yeah, the first stage burns out in two minutes. So it goes through 400, more than 400 tons of propellant in just two minutes. Mm -hmm. And by then it will have reached uh, 40, more than 40 kilometers of altitude and be traveling at 6,000 kilometers per hour. That's always the thing with rockets. First you go up and then you go fast. So you have to get out of the atmosphere and then, so it's separated now, we can see that in the animation. And yeah. what they do is a, is a hot uh, start of the second end, uh, stage. So it starts while it's uh, attached, so in a split second. Mm -hmm. uh, the second stage is burning. It will burn for three and a half minutes. And that will take us to more than 100 kilometers of altitude, 100, almost 120, and uh, 16,000 kilometers per hour. But first, we'll see the fairing come off. Uh, we should have been going through max Q approximately at the time of uh, separation. That's the highest uh, heat lo load. So it can reach a couple of tens of um, kilowatts per square meter. And you, you do want something protective over the payload when that kind of heat load comes in. Yeah, so what we've just seen, ideally, this is how it works. Obviously, that wasn't a real image. It was an animation for us to get an idea. Yes. Yeah. So the next step should be the separation of the uh, fairing. Yeah. Now, all these, these, these empty stages, uh, the, the first, the second, uh, the third stage, I mean, they're all burning off, and then they're being dropped where? What's happening to them? They have uh, designated drop zones where these um, stages fall. And, uh, so where shouldn't I go next? <laughs> well, you're not allowed to go there. So, but the first stage, so because you're first going up, the first stage drops very close to, to the launch side. And even the, the up, everything up to the second stage drops within less than 2,000 kilometers of the, the launch side. It's only the third stage that travels really far, that travels um, it's dropped, uh, it's, it almost reaches orbit. It's just suborbital and it will fall into the Pacific Ocean. Now, there, there are these three stages and then there's another one called Breeze. The yes. others don't have a name. What is the significant difference here? Well, they do have a name, I suppose. I, I can't remember it. But, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, those, well, those three stages are in itself a self-contained rocket. So if you want to go to low Earth orbit, you just use the, the three lower stages. But if you want to go to anything beyond low Earth orbit, you have to use the breeze on top. And then you still have uh, a, command, a differently commanded, uh, pre-programmed uh, ascent profile for the three lower stages. But then the breeze stage is much cleverer than the previous ones. It can start its engine, switch it off again, turn, wait, switch it back on again. And it can survive up there for 24 hours. So it's, it's really a, a self-contained spacecraft. So we can consider the, mm. the breeze with ExoMars on top as a, as a, as a spacecraft in terms right. of separation of course. So it, it's intelligent. What, what are we seeing here right now, by the way? We're seeing the ascent trajectory the way it should be as it curves away. You see it goes up first and then curves to the northeast. Actually, we have to go to the northeast. We, we, we don't go directly east. We have to go to the northeast uh, uh, so to skirt. So you see the ground track. If you plot it on a map, it would be skirting Mongolia. So it would stay just. Uh, inside Russian territory. Uh, all of this has historic reasons. Okay. Uh, and then uh, we will see it going out over, uh, reaching orbit above, above um, the far east part of Russia. That's where the final orbit of 175 kilometers, the parking orbit will be reached. And then we're going to have um, <clears throat> about a bit more than an hour of waiting until breeze boosts the whole stack into a higher orbit, eccentric orbit, which goes up to 5,000 kilometers. Then we have to wait for about two minutes, sorry, <laughs> we have to wait about two minutes, and then it uh, will go into another higher orbit again. And then we have to wait, then comes the excruciating part, we have to wait for six hours. And, uh, sorry, did I say two minutes? Two hours, and then six hours wait, and then will be the final burn. That will be the fourth breeze maneuver. It will be, um, <clears throat> About eight o'clock okay. our time by then. Central exactly, European it's time. a long day. Yeah. Yes. And I, I just hear that the second uh, stage is gone now, and uh, the fairing jettison is uh, basically happening as we speak right yes. now. What, what exactly happens? Because we can't obviously see it. Well, when the fairing is jettisoned, it falls apart in two, two petals and, and fall, and these fall to the 
uh, <coughs> basically they, they fall uh, back to the earth. They are not in, they don't have orbital velocity. So um, after that, uh, we'll be looking at the third stage and the third stage burns for four minutes and then, <coughs> and then there will be a short coast arc when uh, the engine, the, th the breeze hasn't switched on yet, and then we'll see that running for above a bit more than five minutes. Yeah. By the way, I have mentioned earlier, I'm sure you heard it, that the, the launcher, the Proton-M, is, is one of the largest, heaviest rockets in the world. Why was it chosen, the Proton-M? We have, um, we have a, a, the heaviest spacecraft ever sent to Mars, and uh, this uh, spacecraft has to be accelerated to a high velocity. We leave the Earth with um, 3.7 kilometers per second, so that's really a high it's, that's a lot. <laughs> so in order to, to achieve that, we need a big rocket. So the smaller rockets of Soyuz or that, that kind of class would, that launched, for instance, Mars Express, would not have been able to make it. So you need a real powerhouse to, to push it all up. And I mean, of course, this, this breeze is in this sort of elliptic orbit, and it gets even more elliptic, and it passes a radiation belt, which I, I find uh, a bit scary. Well, that's inevitable. Uh, it's, first, it's in a, in a circular orbit, it's below the radiation belt, and then after the first maneuver, it will push up the highest part of that orbit to 5,000 kilometers, so definitely it will be going through the Van Allen belts, the radiation belts, and uh, twice, one on the, once on the way up and once on the way down, mm. and then on the second orbit again, uh, there's nothing you can do about that. You can just uh, uh, make your spacecraft resist that, but yeah. actually it's not anything that's so unusual. It happens also okay. to geostationary satellites. Okay. Now then, uh, of course, your day job is calculating orbits and traje tra trajectories, and then there's a team, and they basically figure out how the maneuvers must be. This mission, when is it expected to reach Mars? This mission will reach Mars on the 19th of October. The 19th of October. Yes. We can all pencil that down already. That's written in stone. That's a fact. Absolutely. 19th of October. If you have any dates, cancel them. 19th of October this year. A big, big day. Uh, and if you don't believe me, we have prepared something for you to take a look what's happening on the 19th of October. Three days before reaching Mars, the two elements of the ExoMars 2016 will separate. The Schiaparelli Entry, Landing and Descent Demonstrator will detach from the Trace Gas Orbiter. The Aerodynamic Lander will make a controlled entry into the Mars atmosphere. To save power, it will coast through the first phase of descent before reactivating and entering the Martian atmosphere at 21,000 km per hour. The Lander's speed will then be reduced by a protective heat shield and a parachute. Schiaparelli's primary purpose is to test and send back entry, landing and descent information, which may be vital to future missions. In carrying out its demonstrator function, Schiaparelli will provide other scientific information, such as the characteristics of the Mars dust environment. The lander will send back data for several days after touching down. The trace gas orbiter, meanwhile, will enter orbit around Mars some 400 kilometres above the surface of the planet. The orbiter will act as a telecoms platform and a science observatory. As its name suggests, it will identify trace gases and analyse the atmospheric chemistry of the tenuous atmosphere. It will also study the surface and examine the sun during Mars sunrises and sunsets. A high-resolution camera fitted to the orbiter will investigate slope linear, dark lines believed to be associated with liquid brine. These increase during spring and summer and decrease in autumn and winter. The orbiter will also investigate deposits of ice water on the surface and up to a metre beneath the surface. The trace gas orbiter will remain in orbit to support the 2018 ExoMars rover mission. All right, 2018, the next opportunity for us to launch another mission to our Mars. Now, that, this one is on its way. Uh, and I just heard that the third stage has burnt. Um, but let's talk a bit more, Michael, about that breeze upper stage. So it's doing these elliptic orbits, passing the radiation belt, pushing the launcher higher and higher. But it's also very clever, you said already, it's a spacecraft that can do a lot of things. Uh, and it's actually tilting so that the solar arrays that are not yet unfolded can get a bit of light. Why is that important? 
Well, it's a long time, and uh, it's uh, necessary to keep the uh, batteries topped up, so to speak. But also, we, have, we might have thermal problems otherwise, so we have to be sure that uh, nothing gets either too hot or too cold. It's always a concern in space. And how precise is the trajectory of the Proton launcher? Well, Proton is a reliable launch vehicle, and it's been used a lot of times. It's been continuously improved. And uh, of course, we're no nothing made by humans is ever completely precise, but uh, we're going to correct for any imprecision in the, in the escape in the days after launch. Once we've determined the orbit, we have foreseen a slot where we correct, where we perform a maneuver and put mass, uh, ExoMars back on track. All right. Now, the breeze is uh, going through several stages as well. It can switch itself on, off, on, off. I think there's three stages. Can you go through those for us once more? Well, there's first uh, a maneuver that uh, puts Breeze itself onto, onto the slow orbit. Uh, and then uh, there will be the maneuver that inserts into an orbit which goes up to 5,000 kilometers, then 21,000 or 22,000 kilometers, and then the final escape maneuver. And between the, the, before the final one, there will be uh, a tank, uh, an empty tank on the Breeze that can be jettisoned. And that way, we just, uh, uh, the, the breeze will just uh, rid itself of almost a ton of useless uh, dead weight. So it's, it's really intelligent. It decides this is empty, off with you. This is very well designed, I'd say. Yes. Very well designed indeed. Now, of course, as we're nearing Mars, uh, the, 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 the orbiter and the lander, they, they'll be too fast. They'll, they'll have to be some very, very specific maneuvers in order for it not to go elsewhere. Well, the, the lander will just enter the atmosphere with um, arrival velocity, so it will enter at about 21,000 kilometers per, per hour, and then will uh, be breaked down by the atmospheric friction. And this doesn't work for the TGO, so it has to turn around, and it has a main engine on board, and it has uh, two tons of propellant to slow itself down, so it will be braking. And after that, it will have shed sufficient of its velocity to be in a bound, in a captured orbit around Mars. And from there, we have to execute some more maneuvers and also engage in something called aero braking. Very tricky business. That will take a long time. It will take us almost to the end of 2017. And then finally, the spacecraft will be in its final science orbit. Now, you've, you've calculated uh, this flight. And then I said already that there are these experts who then, with your calculations, uh, figure out how the maneuver works. Uh, do you have a say in that? Are you happy with what they've come up with? Or is there anything that worries you right now? I, um, I'm quite happy that they uh, verify everything I've done. And uh, it works also the other way around. I ver we, each of us checks what the other has done. That's Simply, it's not a sign of mistrust or anything. It's just better to do it that way. So um, we all work extremely well together here. So it's, it's a real team effort, which I think is absolutely necessary for a project like this. Michael Kahn. It's an international team effort. It's not just ESA. It's the, the, our Russian friends. It's uh, industry. Also, the Americans. Uh, space flight is teamwork. It's teamwork. Thank you so much, Michael Kahn, for talking us through all these events. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we are well 10 to 15 minutes into the flight of the Proton Launcher now. By the way, this is not actually the Proton Launcher anymore as we know it, because the Breeze Upper Stage has taken over, as we heard, a very clever one here, and it's already performing its first burn at this stage. And this is why this is a good moment for us to go to the main control room again, to Micha Schmidt. Um, now, you're not right now controlling the launch of, obviously, Micha, but uh, do you have information about the first breeze burn already for us? Yeah, this, is, uh, this I can confirm. We get a nice uh, reports from the MCCM from Moscow. So, uh, as far as I can see now, it's really like a picture book performance. So, I have announced the start of the first burn of the breeze uh, upper stage. Okay, well, that sounds good. Picture book, that's what we want. Uh, Micha, Micha, there'll be more burns. What are you doing in Darmstadt in that period? 
Monica, I have to apologize. It's very rude. I didn't listen to you because I was just listening to MCCM again because I confirm actually that the first burn has completed successfully. Can you repeat your question, please? No, that was much more important than whatever I had to say. That's good news. I just wanted to know what you are doing while all the other burns are going on. Uh, yes, I think Michael Kahn was uh, very nicely outlining what actually the uh, uh, police upper stage is doing, which is not our business. And now uh, we are in standby and we are preparing for the first acquisition of signal when the space card starts radiating, which will be in more than 10 hours, 10 hours, 45 minutes from now. And actually uh, we will do the acquisition of the signal with a smaller dish, which is a Malindi dish. Uh, and then it will gradually go over to bigger dishes, first to Maspalomas, and then finally, because uh, the spacecraft is uh, going away from the Earth quite fastly, we'll go to our deep space network, the 35 meter dishes, which we have to support uh, our ExoMars launch. Indeed, indeed, indeed. And all of this will happen in the course of the day, and especially this evening. Uh, and we'll be catching up with you again then. Michael Schmidt, thank you so much. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Ladies and gentlemen, the first hurdle is taken. ExoMars is launched, but it's not yet on its direct way to Mars. There's still some steps that we have to take. And at this point, we would like to end the morning program here. I would like to thank all my guests uh, who contributed with their knowledge and expertise. Would also like to thank everyone here in the auditorium, everyone watching us online and on TV. Uh, of course, if you're interested in more detailed background information on the mission, its science, then we sh start with short presentations here at 12 o'clock. Uh, which has also been seen on live stream. You can uh, ask our speakers and our experts. Uh, you can send questions via Twitter using the hashtag AskEASA or e hashtag ExoMars. Here in the room, everyone who needs an interview, please grab someone of ESA's communications department offices. Uh, and for those of you out there who are not in Darmstadt, do have a look uh, at ESA's website. That's www.esa.int. Stay in the loop also via Twitter. That is at ESA underscore ExoMars and the Rocket Science blog. There'll be Plenty of opportunity today for you to chat with our experts, also here during the breaks all day long. Of course, at around 10 o'clock this evening, we'll be back here on stage with a live event, and that is when we will bring you the key moment, namely getting the first signal after separation, that is the first autonomous signal. And then we can truly say that ExoMars is on a direct way to Mars. Until then, thank you very much for watching. Fingers crossed. I see you later this evening. Bye.